everyone, I'm Barbara Beck, and I'd like to thank you for tuning in to Welcome Home. Today we're going to be talking about the church's role in coming alongside children who are neglected, abused, and needy. What did Jesus do in his time when there were outcasts? Did he look the other way, or did he encourage people to embrace those who are in need? Listen to this verse from Isaiah 1:17. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, and bring justice to the fatherless. Well, I think scripture's mandate is pretty clear. So we're going to focus our attention on one segment of our country's population, which is needing justice and help, and that's foster care. Our guests today have a heart for children who are in the foster care system. Bill Hancock is with a Christian organization called Fostering Our Future, which tends to the needs of children needing temporary foster care. We'll also be talking to Dr. Gabriel Salguero of a Calvario City Church, who was a foster brother for most of his life. In other words, his biological parents took in lots of children throughout the years who needed help. But before we get to our guests, let's see what the current ladies have to say about children in need and how we as Christ followers can come alongside those precious souls in our communities who are hurting and in need of love and oftentimes a home. Welcome, ladies. Hello. Glad to have everybody here with us today. Uh, thank you. I want to start with you, Leanne, okay. because you are or were a foster mom. I was. Tell for, us about your experiences. For, it wasn't for a very long time. Um, my husband and I, first of all, I was on the board for the Foundation for Foster Children, and I learned um, a lot about the foster care system, and it really just broke my heart um, because we didn't choose to be born to our parents, right, and get or have the um, love that we've had. Um, these children, through no fault of their own, end up in a place um, that's really sad. And so learned a lot about it, and I felt maybe we should try to become foster parents. So my husband and I went through a class. You it's, it's a big deal. It doesn't, yeah. it's not like they just let anybody become, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was like a 10 week class and, um, and we did it three different times. And the longest time I think we had a little boy was for about three weeks. Um, and it was, it was a lot harder than I thought. Mm -hmm. um, because, what was hard about it? You know, I think you want, you want them to know that you care for them. And a lot of times they're coming from places that, They've either already been in lots of different places and um, they're angry, maybe can't, they can mm -hmm. be, not necessarily. Um, and you can't really treat them how you treat your children. You can't have quite the same discipline. Um, and it's just a little bit uncomfortable for somebody like me who's a bit of a perfectionist and want mm -hmm. to do parenting so well. Mm -hmm. um, and then also at that time, we didn't have the space. That child, we were only accepting boys because um, we only had two bedrooms or Mm -hmm. for our children and so the boy needed to stay in Chase's room mm -hmm. so our it, our house wasn't quite conducive um, to it as well. Did you get older um, children each time? Um, each time it was under five. Okay. There was like a four-year-old wow. and um, um, another five-year-old I think so um, yeah. But it was hard. It was hard, but I mean, it was awesome too. Like yeah. I, I was looking for kind of a calling from the Lord. Like, am I, are we supposed to do this long-term? Are we not? I, it was before um, my non-compete ended on for a business and I decided that, you know, he really did want me to go back into a little bit more mm -hmm. business role. So, and then there's also the chance that when you do bring in a, ch a foster child, that the, an adoption could actually take place. Oh, now right. that's not the intent. Yeah. The intent of foster care is to give a person a temporary home and restore that home, yeah. but that doesn't always happen. In a perfect well, world, it would be great if the they all The people went back. that we went through the class with, there were probably um, 20 other couples, or sometimes it was an individual. Um, maybe three or four of them were seeking to adopt through really? the foster care system. Wow, yeah, great. and so they really were looking for babies yeah. um, and not necessarily like toddlers. or. You were know. you open to that? Had that happened in your Adoption? circumstances? I think we would have been um, if it had been the right thing. I think we were kind of open to whatever. Yeah. Um, have you other ladies have in, had any kind of desire to bring in children into your home like that? Have I you, Carolyn? Did, I tried. When I was a little girl, um, well, not little girl, just younger in my single days, I was like 20 some. Um, I went and started working as a cuddler at the hospital. Mm. And where you go in and the babies that, you know, are very young, there's a lot of parents who don't come in and visit these children. Mm. I'm telling you, 
It was the funnest thing I've ever done, but my heart began to break because there would be little children there for seven, eight days ready to be checked out and no one was ever coming to get them. Mm. So I started realizing there was something. Yeah. And then there was another little girl that I remember was two years old and weighed about 35 pounds or 30 pounds because the mother was not feeding her. Mm. And so when you would feed her, she would eat and eat and eat till she would regurgitate because mm -hmm. she was so afraid she wasn't going to get food again. And oh. man, my heart, I just began, I would sing over and pray over and thinking, God, let these words penetrate somewhere in her heart that she doesn't believe the lie that the enemy right. would love to say to her, that right. you don't matter. Right. But um, so I tried to go and be a foster parent. But at that time, I was ministering on the road about 300 days a year. Yeah. And they said, you've got to be willing to get a child at three and turn it back in at 320. Mm -hmm. And they're like, and if you're, cause I'm right. like, well, couldn't I bring the bit, you know, the child know. with me? I'm like, how fun would this be? And they're right. like, no, you really, right. you got to be. And so, but you know, it was funny because just this week before I even knew we were going to do this, my daughter who's 12 looks at me and says, mom, have you ever thought about adopting or being a foster parent? And I was wow. like, well, and I told her the story. Uh -huh. And then as we begin to dive into this, I'm like, Lord, mm -hmm. are you maybe saying, that's why I'm so interested in hearing what you all have to say mm -hmm. and what it was like, because I mean, this is something, this is very dear yeah. to God's heart is Absolutely. to take care of the orphans and, and the widows. And let's talk about what some of the needs are out there. Kristen, you've done a little homework and you have some stats which are staggering. Right, right. right. So some of the things that I read when I was preparing for the show is that on any given day, there are over 415,000 children who are living in the U.S. foster care system. And the number clearly continues to be on the rise. Well, can um, I add just to that before you go yeah. on? Double that number need to be in in the foster care mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. and there are, mm -hmm. Carolyn, not enough homes. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's, to me, the sad part. Half a million are in homes, and that's great. Praise God mm -hmm. for the half a million. Another half a million have no place to go. Yeah. What well, else? Can I just add to yeah. that even? Um, what we learned through fun, uh, the Foundation for Foster Children is there's probably double that that are in homes of relatives that mm -hmm. don't go through the foster care system, mm -hmm. but they're really being fostered or raised by yeah. either an aunt, a grandparent, but um, because they're wow. a relative, they're not necessarily Considered, designated. Right, yeah. Foster. Right. yeah, That was me. Yeah, yeah there yeah, you go. Yeah, exactly. My mother didn't raise me. My parents did not raise me. My great grandparents raised mm -hmm. me. And it wasn't until I was an adult mm -hmm. that I realized that there was every possibility that I could have been in the foster care system mm -hmm. had my great grandparents yeah. not taken the responsibility yeah. for raising my brother and myself. But I want to say this as well. When you start talking about the numbers, a lot of those kids are not in foster homes like where Leanne's home right. is, your home or my home. They're in group homes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're in group homes and they're being bounced from one place to the other. Yeah. So by the time some of these children land in a home like Leanne's home, your home, Barbara, or my home, mm -hmm. they have been to so many places, not even thinking about the abuse that they went through in their home with mm -hmm. their biological parents. Right. Right. And so it is difficult because you don't, oftentimes you don't have history. You don't know where these children have been. You don't know what they've gone through. Right. And they're looking at you and they're angry because they already know that you're going to be a temporary. That's right. And what they really want is they want a permanent home. They want a mommy and a daddy and they don't right. care what color you are. They don't right. care where you, they want somebody mm -hmm. that is going to love them and, and that's going to invest the time and the energy that it takes to 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 create a life and a family mm -hmm. for for them, and so yeah. that's the that's the sad part about mm -hmm. foster care is that there's not enough of us, right. mm -hmm. and and I'm saying us because when we have conversations like this, it's kind of convicting. You start feeling like you know God has really blessed me, and we have space and we have the ability to be able to take a couple of children. My husband would just kill me if I came home with a couple <laughs> kids. Um, but you know, you, when you when you start talking about it and you realize that there are children that yeah. really need, they just need some stability in their lives, mm -hmm. and then they get turned out. They hit a. How do you? Well, that's, you, you that's top the out thing. of foster yeah. care. You age out. That's yeah. the thing that strikes me and yeah. really guts me is that you age out at 18. Mm -hmm. And these kids that age out of the system, so many of them are not prepared yeah. emotionally, financially to support themselves. Not at all. They're not mm -hmm. at all. 
Well, yeah. and don't they say it's only like 3% of them go on to get a college education? Mm-hmm. I mean, come mm-hmm. on, guys. Mm-hmm. That's because, you know, we don't understand yep. how powerful that family unit is mm-hmm. of just that encouragement. You know, I want to bring it back to how powerful our family unit, we we take it so for granted yeah. that we have each yeah. other to turn to. Yeah. And, and But it, my one of my girlfriends, Kalina Tara, I know she's been on our show mm-hmm. with us before. Her family, their whole life, still to this day, fosters. Her mom's 75 and has three children right now in her home. Wow. Wow. And um, I was just talking with her some about it just this week, and she said, Carolyn, the story. She said, Mm -hmm. we get kids that will come in our home, what you're just saying right there. And she said, they would go to our our refrigerator and say, really? We we can get food when we want it out of there? And and they would tell them stories of other foster homes that they had been in Mm -hmm. that literally people had put locks Mm -hmm. on their doors, Mm -hmm. on their refrigerators. And I mean, hopefully this does, because I believe this is a calling for, it it isn't for everybody. Mm -hmm. I do think that you need to be called, but for somebody who is out there today going, I'm looking for a place to put my ministry, my mm-hmm. gifts to use. I think mm-hmm. there's some of the, these older people are going, you know, I want, I don't have grandchildren or maybe they're not close to me, but I could do something. Maybe there is a little knock on people's hearts going, mm-hmm. I want to get uncomfortable for a little bit mm-hmm. because that really is what this is all about is getting out of our comfort zone and uh, reaching out to people who, I mean, these kids, it's what she is saying is so true. I mean, she said that they'll come in and they start immediately calling her auntie. Anything just to feel some kind of normalcy. And it just, my heart well, just breaks. And if the homes are not open to them, then they'll find other ways to be accepted and included. And one of those is gangs. You know, I, I learned a horrible fact about gangs yesterday that when a child goes into a gang, oftentimes the only way he can get out of that gang, that family, that's his new family, mm-hmm. is um, by getting stabbed or getting killed or getting some kind of physical punishment to to get himself out of the gang. So so we do need to be aware of the needs that are out there, but also very cautious to pray through that and make sure that we're called to do that. Yes. Uh, if we're not called, then it's going to be worse. And then somebody out there today might be listening and saying, but I'm not equipped to do that. You know, Leanne went through 10 weeks of, mm-hmm. of training and yet God's the only one that's going to equip you. Mm-hmm. You, even with all your training, you mm-hmm. said it was still difficult, yeah. mm-hmm. and there were still challenges. So, if God is doing the equipping, we don't have to worry about right. not being qualified you know what, to do though? this. I think I think when you feel the call to do something like this, mm-hmm. I think you have to go into it honestly. Yeah, and you have to know that when you take a child in and you don't have information on where that child came from or what their life has been like before, you know that it's gonna be difficult. Yeah. But if you go into it with the attitude that this is gonna be my, my, my child, even if it's for a week or two weeks or two months, because the one thing about foster care, you get a child, you don't know how long that child is gonna be yeah. there because there's not always Um, family members that are going to step up and take this child. And in some cases, there are family members that might want to, but they don't qualify Mm -hmm. for whatever reason. So I think when you go into it with the idea and the mindset that this is my child, then it kind of takes some of the sting out of it because you know that you're going to have hurdles. You know that you're going to have difficulties. We have difficulties with our own kids. Mm -hmm. And so you work, you just work through those things. Why? Mm -hmm. Because this is what God has called you to do. But Barbara, we have some incredible people in our church and I have some incredible friends. Um, And I don't want to get into calling names, but you know, several of the families Mm -hmm. that I know that have been amazing um, in terms of of foster care. But I have a young lady in my church right now. Um, She's in administration in, uh, in, in a school. And I I don't even understand because I know the amount of time that she spends or was spending with her job, decided she wanted to be a foster parent, went through the training. And I looked up in church a couple of weeks ago and she has the most beautiful little Mm. girls, Mm. two and a half years old and four years old. Mm. And I looked across the room on Sunday and she was sitting there with this Mm. two year old just up on her lap with her arms around her. And that is all these kids want. That's right. They don't care if you're living in a box. Right. They really just want the love. And so I had a conversation with her after church and she said, you know, I don't know, I don't know how long they're gonna be here, mm-hmm. but when they leave, I want them to know that somebody cares and that somebody loves them. Mm-hmm. And of course it's her hope that she'll be able to adopt them. Really? Mm-hmm. Are they allowed yeah, to get and back and a four. hold of you? Like once they leave you, are they allowed to contact you again? 
I don't think foster care could keep them from doing it yeah. if, if once they hit 18. Well, right. I don't even, know what happens when even they're... Even the boy that we kept for, um, you know, close to a month, his parents were super grateful. Um, it's his grandparents who actually took him. They were from out of state. Uh, the parents had come down to Florida and gotten themselves in trouble. Um, so they were here getting arraigned and all that. But the grandparents is the ones who took him. But then I kept in touch, you know, for a couple years, sent him Christmas presents and sent him um, oh, birthday great. presents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, yeah. So it just depends. But yeah, there's nothing. Yeah. There's no like like adoption sometimes where it's sealed or anything right. like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, just any chance that we have to pour some love into people. I mean, just like you, you know, I lost my parents very young. So thank God I had lots of siblings, you know, but my 21 year old brother had to become my guardian mm -hmm. or, you know, I would have been put into that system. For a long time, I was tossed around mm -hmm. to a different home. Every two weeks, mm. I moved houses to the point that at one point, I just begged. I packed my bags every time my family had come to visit me, and I'd have my bags packed and just beg them, please mm. take me home. It's not that I didn't love the people I was with. But you just want to be I just home. wanted to be with family. Right. And, you know, my heart, I could just choke up here even mm -hmm. just speaking about it because, man, this is our chance no matter if we're foster parent or not, but to be the hands and feet of mm -hmm. Christ. What an honor. Mm -hmm. What an honor to put our Christianity into action and and love people and encourage them and let them know yeah. you are not your past, yeah. that God is a future, you know? Barbara, you know, the other thing is, and I had been thinking, I had really been thinking about this because there's different ways to be a part of the foster care system. Mm -hmm. You don't always have to foster a child and have them in your home for an extended period of time. I believe there's a way, I mean, this is what I have been thinking about. Holidays are difficult, hmm. especially for foster kids. It's Christmas, it's Thanksgiving, it's Easter, mm -hmm. whatever. And we always get together as a family and we have a great big family gathering, all this food and fun and whatever. And I had just been thinking there has to be a way, and I'm, I'm pretty sure there is, to be able to connect with foster care and say, you know what, can I have four kids for this holiday? Mm -hmm. Even if it's just for a That's day yeah. to be able yeah. to bring them, you know what I'm saying? Well, there's some respite um, care, which right. is super important for um, foster families that are that are doing long-term fostering. And they um, there's so many difficulties about it. Sometimes they can't go out of state. So if the family needed to go somewhere, the, um, the, the foster children aren't allowed to travel across state oh. lines. So wow. you, can, you can help for a few days. Yeah. But you still have or, to get right. qualified yeah. or trained. Well, or... the respite um, foster care is not quite as stringent. Okay. Um, the regular fostering, which I'm glad, it is very stringent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, they're serious mm -hmm. about it, which yeah. is good. It is good. They should be, because we know in the right. past. They right. Well, that's always. what I wanted to share about, too, is that um, one of the articles that I read said, you know, fostering isn't for everyone. Mm -hmm. You really have got to pray about it, and it's got to be a calling from the Lord. But if, if you come to the point where you think it's not maybe for my family right now, or it's not for us forever, there are ways to help those families who are fostering. Some of that is respite care. Some mm -hmm. of it is making meals mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. some of those families. We have um, mm -hmm. a, a dear family friend who is um, helping me out in some ways by bringing meals, a couple meals every week because our schedule is a little bit hectic right now. And I cannot tell you mm -hmm. the amount of love that I feel for this woman <laughs> because she is meeting just a very um, significant need to provide home cooked meals for our family. So. And it's a, it's a huge endeavor. She says it's nothing, but it is. I mean, they are home-cooked meals, four, four or five courses. But to be able to do that for other people, mm -hmm. to bring home-cooked meals or takeout. She gave us takeout this say, week. I she gave us takeout this day. week, and it was great. <laughs> right. It was great because I didn't have to prepare dinner. Right. So, um, And then also scripture promises to maybe cooking isn't your thing and maybe respite care, babysitting is not mm -hmm. the thing, but to write encouraging notes and letters and to give scripture mm -hmm. to that. say, you know, this is what the Lord promises, you can do this. Well, and I'll just That's talk good. about the foundation for foster children. What one of the couple of things they do to add on to that is some of these uh, foster kids have never had, like for instance, like a birthday celebration, mm -hmm. and so they give gift cards um, to the fostering families to give to the foster children, mm -hmm. and they do um, like maybe a lesson, like a sp or prom dresses, mm -hmm. things that you know they might not ever had 
experience and that the foster parents can't afford. Um, so just coming alongside um, is a great way mm -hmm. yeah. to help. What are some other verses besides the Isaiah verse that I um, referenced earlier? Do you all have any other verses that speak to this? Yeah, I mean, I have the one that we've all probably heard of, Matthew 25, 40, that the king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, and also in Matthew 18, 5, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love. Carolyn, you have one? I have Psalm 68, 5. Forgive me, I don't have my glasses. A father of the fatherless and a judge yes. for the widows is God in his holy habitation. Mm -hmm. He really cares mm -hmm. about the widows and the orphans. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, and we live in sort of a culture, the Western culture, that um, the extended family does not always step up to the plate it, like it does in other cultures. Right. And so we have to determine whether or not uh, there are ways that we can come alongside families and people that we know so that we can get out of that. All it is, the base baseline is, is that it's selfishness on our part to not want to mm -hmm. give up our time and our freedom mm -hmm. and maybe even some of our resources. So if we recognize it and God is knocking on the door of our hearts, I think it's so important. I know recently one of the verses that God's been talking to me about is the one in Proverbs 31. We always think that's the Proverbs woman, but it's all, well, this is part of the Proverbs woman mandate is speak up. For those who have no voice, mm -hmm. speak up for those who are neglected, oppressed, destitute. Those are foster children right That's now. Right. And, and if you're in a position today where God is calling you, we would caution you to not jump on the bandwagon just because we're talking about it today. We're not jumping. I'm not jumping on the bandwagon with my family. We did do foster care back when, when Kristen was five years old. We took in a little, uh, two little boys, a two-year-old and a three-year-old, and kept them for about five months. And Leanne, it was one of the most difficult things that we've ever had to do because uh, we don't want it to sound like it's, it's something easy because it's not. But if God is calling you to do that, I hope that this program today has inspired you to, uh, to pray about it and then maybe to make that to engagement in somebody else's life because uh, that's what scripture would have us do. We have more coming up for you, so don't go away. We have to rethink foster care. The foster family is not adversarial to the biological family. Mm -hmm. It, it is there to serve, to right. help. Some, right. some people need some time to get their life back together mm -hmm. and then receive their children back. Do you have a giving plan for 2018? I know my husband and I do. We look to the Lord to see where our giving will have the most impact. And the first place we commit to is our local church. It's very important to us to tithe to our church. But then we pray about what other ministries we should be giving to. I hope you know that Good Life 45 is a ministry. Our heart is to share Christ in compelling ways. We have so many people call, write, and email us saying that our programming brings them such comfort and draws them closer to Christ. Think about television and how many people watch. We broadcast to over 1.5 million homes in Central Florida and really around the world because of our programming being on the internet. So it's with utmost confidence that I can encourage you to give to Good Life 45. Your donations are making an eternal difference in countless lives. Please consider having our ministry as one which you support both prayerfully and financially throughout 2018. We are truly grateful for each of you. God bless you for your generosity and partnership with Good Life 45. We are where hope happens. Hey everyone, I'm so glad that you joined us today. May is National Foster Care Awareness Month, and we need to be looking at some of the reasons why we need to be prayerful about this. Those people who do open up their homes uh, to come alongside them, to help them, to serve them, but also, is there a possibility that you and your home would be great candidates to open up your hearts to children who are in need? Well, let's find out a little bit more about it. We have one of my favorite returning guests here with us today, Dr. Gabriel Salguero. 
pastor at Calvario City Church. Thank you, Gabriel, for being here with us. Thank you. Always an honor to be here, and I'm glad you're covering this uh, subject. Oh, I am too. Well, thank you for bringing it to our attention because it is something that we need to be talking about. So uh, you brought a good friend of yours here with us today, Bill Hancock. You are, I want to get this right, Bill, because you are a superstar. <laughs> you're That's the right. project manager and lead consultant for fostering our future. That's correct. What is fostering our future? What does that even mean? Fostering our future is a coalition of church leaders, pastors, and trained family advocates here in Orange County and Osceola County, Florida, that's working together to solve the foster care problem here in our community. Not, not enough families to yes. serve the children who need them. Yes. And when families do serve, they need support. Right. And so we wanna make sure that they're supported, they receive mm -hmm. the training, and so we're here to make sure there's more than enough families for the children who need them in our community. Why you? are You are a foster parent, yes. right? And yes. through the years, you and your wife have fostered about how many children? Oh, close to 100 kids. That is just mind-boggling. I cannot even believe that. Well, I've been at it a long time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you were like 25 years old. Come uh, on, no, Bill. I look like it, Yeah, but I'm you not. do. You definitely do. Okay, so, so you and your wife decided how many years ago that you wanted to start opening up your home? Well, foster care actually found us. When oh, really? We, we were in college here in Lakeland, Florida, mm -hmm. Southeastern University. Yeah. And we were working for the Florida Baptist Children's Home because we had to work our way through school. And that's where I met my first foster child in a 24-hour emergency shelter. Oh. And so I'm studying theology Monday through Friday, mm -hmm. and then I'm trying to put together uh, my, my world with traumatized mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, th that children deserve better than what I experienced they were receiving mm -hmm. when they were abused, neglected. And so it become a driving force within my heart, within my marriage, and within my family now for over three decades to make sure that when a child was couldn't be kept at home, yes. that there was a Christian family, well-trained and well-supported in the community that child could go to. We, until they have a home, institutions mm -hmm. is the only solution. So you had three biological children of your mm -hmm. own, have three mm -hmm. children. How did they respond to having a bunch of, a hundred kids coming in and out of your home throughout the years? Well, it was not easy. I mean, it was always a challenge because you've got children coming and going. Probably the, mm -hmm. the, the biggest challenge for them was when a child had uh, had to, to go, yeah, and because they, they, we loved them like they were our own. They didn't resent the coming in. No, they just liked the leaving. It was hard home. to let go because wow. they treated them like brother and sister. We treat them like our own children, so yeah. they treat them like brother and sister. But what okay. we observed over time, as they matured and as they grew, they learned that when you're called to serve God, mm -hmm. sometimes there's there's challenges and. We yeah. realized that as a family, that was our mission and that was our calling. Mm -hmm. And that together, uh, we would just grow uh, through those processes of letting go and yeah. feeling uh, the, sh the shared pain yeah. of someone you love leaving. But we also realized, and they really bought into, was the fact that you know eventually we all leap. Mm. They will grow up one day and right. leave. And we talked right. about developing your future and your family one day on the principles of Christ and compassion in the home. Yes. And they they today open their own home. They're involved. Do in, they really? Yeah, they're That's in, fantastic. They're involved in ministry uh, in local church uh, throughout uh, the community. And they continue to carry on the tradition of compassion, not just through the church, but wow. in their home. Well, let me tell you, that is some serious good parenting in your home. Well, kudos to you and your wife. Well, grace really. be to God. Yes. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, right. it's, I always tell my kids that if, if we get any credit, that goes to the Lord. If we get any criticism, I own that. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's a humble way to say it. Now, I don't understand how the state and the church can work together on this because yours is a Christian organization. Yes. Praise God for that. Yes. Looking for Christian homes to yes. put foster children into. Right. So what does the state have to say about that? Well, the state needs help. Um, you know, there, there are more children in our community than there are foster families, and they have a mandate to recruit families and make sure that children are safe and stable True. in homes. Right. So the challenge of meeting that mandate uh, is is a, is a large uh, a goal for them to reach every year. Okay. Unfortunately, without the community rallying and becoming a good partner with the state, that job cannot be realized. Mm -hmm. So that they work with us 
to, so that we can work with our church coalition to do three things, to recruit, mm -hmm. to raise awareness like mm -hmm. we are here, right. and then to recruit families, but not just families, but volunteers that w they won't foster, but they'll mm -hmm. support those who foster. Right. Because that's the way the body works. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're able to come alongside the state. The state has standards mm -hmm. by which they've put in place to make sure children are safe, to meet the mandate they have, so we take those standards and we make sure that we organize, operationalize, mm -hmm. and make sure we're training and supporting families according to those standards. Oftentimes, we exceed them I'm sure. because I'm sure. of our passion right. and our intent to do good. Well, they must love having you. I mean, they should. Is this a, is this a national organization or is it pretty much local in, in Central Florida? It's working through, the, th working through the Assemblies of God. We're working okay. through the National Children's Service Organization. Okay. But there's also pockets of this going on mm. in communities all around the country. Okay. There are 660,000 children in foster care in the U.S. That's really sad. And there are 3,144 counties yeah. that make up the 50 states. And in every county, there's churches mm. that are willing, mm. they're just not yet able. Right. So our ministry right. comes in Good. working with churches to enable them oh, to do wonderful. what God has called them to do. Well, praise God for giving you that vision. That is amazing. Thank you. So Gabriel, you notice I've gone from t calling you Dr. Gabriel, Dr. Salguero. Now you're my buddy. I see you so much now. I feel uh, like you're my friend. I prefer the uh, no titles. You're so like my little boy. I'm honored You're by like my I little boy him. now. Well, thank you. Gabriel, Gabriel, your parents were foster That's parents, right? right? So yeah. is that why you have this kind of involvement? I think that my parents are exceptional people. Yes. Well, they look are, at you. That, Come well, on. Well, despite me, they're exceptional <laughs> people. And uh, my parents are pastors in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and they were foster parents. So That's I had great. foster siblings and for, I mean, dozens and dozens growing up. Do you keep up. up with any of them? I do. Do you really? I do. Wow. I do. They're, you know, they're not... They're my siblings. Yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, and some of them okay. are married and have children of their own. Wow. And uh, one of one of my siblings went on to graduate school and is still very connected. And so I don't know how many dozens have gone through my house. My brother and his wife are foster parents. And um, it's just... You're next, Gabriel. Uh, you know that, right? I, I, th you I, know that. I do it joyfully. <laughs> I do it joyfully. I think that for me, the, the, the calling... Yeah. It's not just the experience. I think the gospel calls it to us. Yeah. You know, mm. some of the most famous foster children, of course, it's, they weren't called foster children in the Bible, right. were picked up by a relative or a loved one, Esther. That's true. That's true. Esther, her cousin, yes. took yeah. her in after right. her. She was an orphan, and That's both her right. parents passed away. Abraham took in his nephew, uh, Lot. And mm -hmm. so there are there are multiple mm -hmm. examples of Scripture mm -hmm. uh people being raised, children being raised by a family that loved them that right. wasn't their biological family. And so so we have the template and we need to help the church. They want to do it. Exactly. But as 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 you've said, Bill, they need the training because it can yes. seem overwhelming, the right. state standards. Right. And so they need a Sherpa. Somebody says, look, That's right. we know where your heart is. You know, we know you love children and we know you need quality training. And mm -hmm. most importantly, I think what Bill said is wraparound services. Yes. Absolutely. It, it, it takes a lot. The reason my parents could be foster parents is because the help. church supported yep. them. The neighbors yep. supported mm -hmm. them. And that right. takes training yep. for quality mm -hmm. and safe foster families uh, mm -hmm. for young people and children. That's mm -hmm. key. And the church it, church is certainly a big response to, to that challenge. Well, you brought up um, the mandate in Scripture. And here's one on the back of your card, Bill Hancock. It says from Isaiah 117, learn to do good, pretty good, bringing mm -hmm. in foster children, seek justice, correct oppression, and bring justice to the fatherless. That is such a great key verse that we need to keep in mind. Why do we do it? Well, Scripture shows it with examples like you've just mentioned, but also the mandate to take care of those, the weak, the disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. We talk about that a lot here, and Gabriel has been really good about bringing that to our attention. So so thank you for that, and a, once again, an opportunity to come alongside the church and the state in taking care of some of these needy people. About Let's get real practical, Bill. Okay. When you keep a foster child, what's a, the average length of time he or she is in your home? Well, the average length of stay is about a year, about six to 12 really? months. Really? Yeah. What happens when they leave? Well, the, the plan for most children in foster care is to return back to their parents. Does that happen most of the about time? About seven out of 10 times. That's great. Yeah. Wow. They go back to their family. Okay. 
it's that going back to the family, and you mentioned it earlier in our family, it yeah. was for us to let go. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's driven me to be a part of a national solution through the local churches is the fact that when that child goes back, there's an opportunity to build a bridge to that whole family. That's true. That whole family that's system true. is there. And that's where the vision, yeah. instead of letting go, yeah. I was able to finally see that, wait a minute, this is not a letting go. This is a following through. Yeah. And do you do that? Do you oh, yes. still have contact with the parents and the home? And yes. The yes. Yeah. My three foster kids in my home now, which by the way, we have permanent custody of those children now. What does that mean? Why are you not adopting them if they're foster children? Well, there's, there's a lot of practical reasons related okay. to their biological mother and okay. the family system. But I've never heard of permanent foster care. Uh, well, permanent, um, not permanent foster care. This is, they're no, they left foster care okay. and they're stayed with us. They're permanent what? What'd you call them again? We, custody. We have permanent, permanent custody. custody. Got it. Okay. Now, and okay. this is the point. When children leave foster care, typically when they're in the foster care system, they have access to goods and services. Sure. Sure. Okay. Once they leave those 70% and go back to their family, all those service, goods and services go away. Oh, okay. So working through the okay. local church, through Compassion Ministry, in an organized, systematic way, yeah. we're able to really build relationships. During that six right. months to 12 months, those seven out of 10 children, when they're going yeah. back, we're able to, tr to bridge the gap yes. to that family. Right. And, and that's the Ministry of Reconciliation. Yes. Mm. We have to rethink foster care. The foster family, is not adversarial to the biological family. It, it is there to serve, to right. help. Some, right. some people need some time to get their life back together mm -hmm. and then receive their children back. What happens and, if it is adversarial? Sometimes and, it and, is, and Sometimes right? it is, and sometimes... <laughs> we advocate. Yeah, okay. that's where advocacy okay. comes yes. in to speak up because yeah. The, yeah. if children or young people are in danger, that's, that's a very particular sure. situation that yes, requires sure. us to lift our voice. But if you can help a family right. mm -hmm. get right. themselves together, and then even after they leave your custody, you can be kind of a, a sister family, yeah. help them raise a child. Yeah. They, my yeah. brother is very good friends with one of the uh, biological parents of one of his foster children. Okay. And they, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. So they don't have less parents mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Now they yeah. have more <laughs> parents. And, right. and I consider mm -hmm. uh, him my nephew, yeah. even though he's not wow. biologically connected to me. Wow. And I know... Uh, his mother, he's raised yeah. a single mom. Mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. his mother. Mm -hmm. We have parties together. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's a, a ministry of reconciliation yeah. around being yeah. foster care that, that the church is, is, is primed to do. I think that Bill can speak m with more clarity to this, is that people feel overwhelmed at mm -hmm. the standards. How can we do it? Mm -hmm. How can we check mm -hmm. the boxes? What's the right training? What? And, mm -hmm. and I think that's where we need a a national campaign where churches say, right. hey, we need the training, we right. need to know what the law is, so that we can not right. just meet the standards, we can exceed the standards mm -hmm. yeah. and be the mm -hmm. best foster families we can be. Well, it sounds like the state is willing to do that, which is pretty much a big hurdle that's already been crossed, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. That's amazing. Many states are, are, are willing uh, to, to be a very collaborative and cooperative yeah. partner with the local church. Yeah. But it's important that the local church leaders be well-informed, as uh, Gabriel's saying, well-informed, well-equipped, well-trained to understand the complexities mm -hmm. of child protection. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a very complex and complicated environment. Yeah. We, we say yeah. we'll never make fostering easy, but we can help make it simpler. Mm -hmm. It's very complicated. Mm -hmm. So people don't really clear, how do I get involved? And a lot of the viewers today will want to yeah. go, how do I get involved? Right. If I, I believe that the church has a mandate to care for, for vulnerable children and right. I, particularly the most vulnerable in right. child welfare, but where do I start? Where's the mm -hmm. on ramp? Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what we're what's what we're doing together mm -hmm. is we're building on ramps so the local church knows how to create an opportunity for the church right. to engage, right. but to care for the child but follow through and make sure that when you are able to send a child home, if that child is going home and we are confident that child is safe, the family is stable, when those services go away, now not only do we have an opportunity to restore a family, but we have the opportunity to renew a community.
And also just the ministry of, you mentioned reconciliation, Gabriel, but mentorship. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, if you continue to have a relationship with that foster mm -hmm. child, once he has made the exit out of your home mm -hmm. and you can mentor those parents, if they're looking up to you, yes. and, then, and then I'm sure yeah. in most cases they are, because what a great favor you just did for them for mm -hmm. almost a year, having mm -hmm. that child in your home. Mm -hmm. So is it unreasonable to ask churches to be involved in this? And, or is it just Assembly of God churches that are going to be doing it? Or can any church out there? Well, as you know, NALIC is interdenominational evangelical Tell churches. Tell everybody what that is So again. NALIC is the acronym for the organization I serve. Right. It's National Latino Evangelical Coalition. And it's 3,000 or so Hispanic evangelical congregations. Uh, and we're partnering now with the Assemblies of God. But we have Wesleyan, Nazarene, non-denominational evangelical churches. So there are 3,000 churches out there doing this? They are, we are in the awareness campaign. Got and so, okay. so we, uh, during uh, National Foster Care Awareness Month, mm -hmm. we launched our Nuestros Niños campaign, which is a, a primer That's on great. here's how you get involved. Yes. Here's how you advocate. Because the first hurdle I think Bill could say is education. Mm -hmm. Before you can mobilize somebody, mm -hmm. They need to know, okay, what am I getting into? Right. And we don't want to romanticize it. Right. This is tough it's work. It's hard. Yeah. Love is tough. Yeah. It lo it's always yeah. been tough. Absolutely. And love is, is, is challenging. Uh, there are a uh, complexity of systems mm -hmm. and families and children. And so what we want to say is, look, we're going to give you the best training possible. Mm -hmm. And that's what NALIC is doing around the okay. education awareness. And we're also going to tell you what the best practices are. Mm -hmm. Here's what we've learned. You know, here's what people who've been in foster care for decades have learned doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so you're not reinventing mm -hmm. the wheel. Right. You don't feel, I'm right. getting into this, mm -hmm. you know, my first year, and I'm. Well, it's not what I expected. You right. have people who are seasoned foster care parents, right. people who are seasoned in navigating Good. the foster care systems, right. and who have... Uh, the best interests of the children and young people. Right. Mm -hmm. So how long is the training that, that parents go through? Well, there's, there's a series of trainings. Okay. When a church wants to get involved, and if a pastor or someone in that church wants to, to get involved in community-based foster care as ministry of the local church, the first training is church ministry team leader training. Okay. So we, because we believe that is the work of the pastor leader to equip believers mm -hmm. for the work of ministry. Right. Right. So the church comes at this from mm -hmm. a leadership step one, mm -hmm. a leadership development. Mm -hmm. So this is a lay run ministry. Okay, good. So the, the, the pastor, lead pastor or a designated pastor within the church identifies a leadership, okay. an advocate, someone that will come to our training. It's a one day training. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a six hours. And in that we teach four things, how to cast vision, raise awareness through your church and local community to how to develop and implement an annual recruitment ministry plan. Mm -hmm. The third thing is to recruit families to foster and mm -hmm. volunteers to wrap around them to support those Good. who foster. And the fourth thing is how to manage the ministry to maintain a healthy growing right. ministry in your right. church. Good. So we teach, that's leadership. The okay. second thing is we train volunteers to half day training to know if you're not, if you won't be fostering, but you're going to support someone who fosters, okay. here's the things you need to know nice. about the system, nice. like things that. you can do, things you mm -hmm. can't do. Mm -hmm. Here's some do's, here's some don'ts, and Good. here's some things about working with, with treat children who've been traumatized. Yeah. Even if you're just mentoring or transporting or babysitting, there are some things you need to know. Because I'll tell you, that's probably one of the biggest barriers is somebody yeah. saying, there's no way I could do that. I have no. no idea how to handle a kid who's been sexually abused. With the proper training, right? for proper training, biblically informed, yeah. you will yeah. I can't believe the healing that takes wow. place. And this is a, such amazing. a necessary ministry, Barbara, because the number of traumatized children in America, yeah. and the world for that matter, yeah. but our ministry is, is, is uh, based here in the United States, is increasing every year. Mm -hmm. You want to give some numbers? I looked Look, up some numbers. You want me to help you with I, this? I would. I okay. would love but to you hear. probably know something that uh, I don't know. That's Let's hear. All right. What I looked up and found out that there are 60,000 abused or neglected children identified per week and a million a year need to be in foster care. One million kids out there a year mm -hmm. need to be in foster care, but we can only accommodate about half of those people. That's mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. and, and so if the need is there and the church you know, I think it's time for the church, and now I'm speak of the Evangelical Church and Pentecostal Church right. from which I right. uh, come, but other right. churches as well. We need to be known for what we're for, mm. not just for what we're against. Yeah. And children, which are often among the most vulnerable mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. traumatized children, mm. whether it's through gun violence, domestic abuse, sexual exploitation, harassment, uh, 
trauma yeah. on so many levels. Yeah. We are healing communities, you know. Right. I often read uh, Henry Nouwen mm -hmm. uh, and his famous book, Wounded Healers. We all have our wounds, we all have, but if we're able to help children through this right. in a way that's loving, yeah. that's safe, that yeah. respects their right. dignity mm -hmm. and their history, I think the country will say, well, well maybe we have it wrong yeah. about the Christian church. Maybe, maybe there's something more to this. And they can see they can see that we're a loving community and we're a healing community. Well, and then with all the gun violence and the mental illness and all of that that's out there, you know, if we have healthy homes and we're training these children how to be healthy, and then taking them when they exit, giving them a, a, an opportunity to be in a healthy home environment again mm -hmm. that has been mentored and has mm -hmm. been reconciled, then possibly we can reduce some of the violence. And the I love how you used the word civility the other day when we were talking. Mm -hmm. We need more civility, also known as love in our mm -hmm. culture. You know, I make pop cultural references. I'm a kid of the 80s. Mm -hmm. and, and Whitney Houston was everything oh, uh, she was, you know yeah. she's from new jersey from where i'm from she i had, saw her in concert in person is that right yes i did yeah. but go ahead <laughs> and uh i we, loved her well yeah amazing voice mm. raised in the church in newark yes. new jersey yes she mm. had a song that said i believe the children are the future yes i remember that teach them well yes. and let them lead the way show right. them all the beauty right. they possess inside give them a sense of pride yeah mm. and and that that song. Can you sing that? Do you think, Gabriel? I could, like, but I, I but, don't know how no. pleasant the okay, hearing okay, would be. Okay, so then we'll yeah, just not, yeah, we'll yeah, not do that. <laughs> As a singer, I'm a great preacher. <laughs> Maybe uh, stick to spoken that's word. That's okay, right. <laughs> keep talking then. <laughs> and, and, and so this pandemic, this yeah. epidemic of traumatized children mm -hmm. and families, if we have healthy people right. and communities, right. the right. African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can step into that place mm -hmm. with humility, we don't have all the answers. Right, we're, we're learning. Gonna, we're learning, right. and when we make mistakes, we apologize. Right. And, and we're making we, ourselves available. That's right, and, right? and 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 that's half the battle. Yeah, it mm -hmm. is. Here mm -hmm. am I. Yep. Mm -hmm. Send me. That's right. And and so I that's think right. you know I'm appreciative to Bill because I've learned so much. We've known each other for a few months now, and and when God placed on our heart. Uh, foster care and foster care awareness. We were looking for people who had experience, yeah. not just the kind of being a foster parent, which mm -hmm. is uh, uh, invaluable experience, mm -hmm. but navigating the systems, yes. helping churches right. and community-based mm -hmm. organizations mm -hmm. to be supportive. And so, Bill... Well, that's uh, a big vision, as yes. opposed to just one or two families out yeah. there. Call and see if you want to... But no, no you're going to reach yeah. multitudes. Changing yeah. the culture. Yeah. I think changing, yeah. changing the culture, yeah. culture systems around change. foster yes. care. Yeah. 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 And yeah. this is just language. I mean, systems right. change. How do we... Yeah. And there's two things that have to yes. change. So people think, oh, just the systems... Of, of of government and society. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. church has church to change. Systems. Yeah. It's self-understanding yeah. of what it means to be church. throughout both private public sectors, mm -hmm. both community and national initiatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know that God speaks to this guy, right? Absolutely. I mean, he sought you. He he found you. Is that right? Is that what I'm hearing? We because were brought divinely together. Yeah. No he, question. He has no a heart, question. and you have a heart. Yeah. And, and Calvario City Church is going to be one of those churches trained to be able to offer foster care for That's right. That's who right. knows how many families. That's right. We're almost out of time. I can't stand the thought of that. But I want to ask one more question, Bill, and you both can answer this because you're familiar with what is what is a foster child look like? And I know there are probably a million faces mm. out. Well, there are a million faces wow. out there. But what usually puts a child into foster care? Well, let me, first of all, a little bit about demographics. About 50% of the children who are in foster care are community and around the state and nation. 50% uh, are under the age of nine. Oh, so sad. So they're young. Yeah. Fastest growing population is children under two. Wow. Um, abandoned at birth yeah. in hospitals. Yeah. Those are rapidly growing numbers. <gasps> uh, children having babies, baby children having babies mm -hmm. and not being yeah. well equipped. So uh, the demographics, and then you have about 41% of the children in our community are uh, in foster care are adolescents. Mm -hmm. And if without a home, they end up in institutions, right. which sets them up for major failure. Absolutely. Uh, children are coming with traumatized past uh, experiences. They have difficulty bonding. They have challenges with limits. They struggle with what is good and evil, right and wrong. Right. Um, and then they really are confused about what it means to be a mature adult yeah. because they, they haven't seen a lot of mature adults lead right. in the midst of their own personal crisis. No good role models Say out there. the last thing is children are looking for adults can lead through the complexity of their lives. Mm. Children are facing complex issues. We must lead in the midst of that complexity. Mm -hmm. It will take, uh, as my friend many times says, 
it does take a village. Yes. And in my vernacular, it begins with the church. It takes a church. Absolutely. Sure. Gabriel, you got 10 seconds to wrap us Could up. I have a, a foster brother who's now in his 40s, has children of his own. His, his name is Nestor. Love. There was mis understandings of what love was mm -hmm. and we led with love mm -hmm. and I think it changed my life yeah. I was changed for him coming to my home and I'm, I'm sure he was too thank you so much for being here with us today for all that you're doing there at Calvario City Church Dr. Gabriel Salguero and Bill Hancock if you want more information on fosteringourfuture.info go to that website that's on your screen right now get more information let God pierce your heart um, just be open to the possibility of either volunteering in this or possibly being a foster parent depends on what the Lord is leading you to do but there is a great need out there and I praise God for men like these godly men who see the need and do something Something about it. We have more coming up, so don't go away. We'll be right back. When most people talk about what their life's work is, it usually involves a business they've opened that they've spent years preparing for. Sometimes they'll use this phrase after they've written their thesis or received some sort of public accolade or community award or something. This morning I was meditating on what my life's work is. And I realized my life's work is my loved ones and my family. I stood in the driveway like I do every morning, praying over my family as my husband Tommy walks our son Eli to the bus stop. I watched a bluebird who lives in my front tree do his morning driveway cross from one tree to the other. I watched my dog Tycho stand guard under her tree and count Eli's feet as they step up the steps to the bus. And as she stares down the three squirrels that come out every morning to torture her and tempt her to lose her position. I watched Tommy walk back from the bus and I thought, this little home right here on this little street Yes, Lord, this is my life's work. My daughter, Sarah, woke up and came out and asked me to help her make a quick batch of brownies for a teacher appreciation meeting she forgot she had. We whipped them up quickly. As she got ready for school, then she sat down with my husband and me for breakfast as she opened up about her leadership meeting she had last night at church. She shared with us her love for outreach and how she feels God leading her toward that area of ministry. If my physical heart could have grown the way it felt like it was growing emotionally for me at that point, it probably would have exploded out of my chest. I mean, my girl wanting to serve in the same capacity she watched me serve in for years, through trials and persecutions, joys and wins. She really is choosing to care for the least of these, even after growing up with parents in ministry her whole life? I couldn't say enough thank yous to Jesus in my spirit. Tommy started packing up his briefcase for work, telling me his schedule for the day, and I just started washing the brownie dishes. I said to him, this is my life's work. It's the joy of my heart to have an open home for my nieces and nephews to pop in and visit any time. It's my life's work to make Rice Krispie treats and watch TV with all of them until I fall asleep on the couch and Tommy has to see them out. It's my life's work to make dinner. It's my life's work to make the beds each day and pray over each family member as I pull up the sheets and the blankets. It's my life's work to do the laundry and listen to the Bible as I do so, so I can get better and better at all my tasks. It's my life's work to watch my children grow, choose godly spouses, and then for me to be able to disciple them, these new beautiful additions to our family. It's my life's work to encourage my husband in his plans and purposes. It's my life's work to care for this home that means so much to me, more than just four walls and a roof. This home is where my children have grown up. They've dug their roots deep in Christ and are growing strong in him the same way those old oaks are out in the yard. I know most people would think it'd be the books I've written or ministries or businesses I've helped start that would be my life's work. Yes, those are precious to me and I thank God for each thing he's allowed me to work on under his leadership. But those things suffer in comparison to what really matters to me. My life's work is my tribe that I do life with. 
I'm grateful for every day that God has given me with them. My life's work is watching my family grow in Christ and discover their life's work. Nothing's better than that. My life's work is guarding and helping to grow that deposit that God has made on the inside of every one of my loved one's hearts. My life's work isn't even about me. I guess that's why it brings me such joy. Moms, dads, aunts, uncles, grandparents, what is your life's work? Or should I say who? For more on renewing your mind in the Word of God, visit us at Unforsaken Women sometime or check out our website, unforsakenwomen.com. I hope you enjoyed our program today. We would be wise to commit this scripture verse to memory from Isaiah 117. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, and bring justice to the fatherless. Those are pretty strong mandates about how we should be spending our time. How do we learn to do good, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless? Well, the first step is to recognize the need. And when I discovered that there are over 1 million children in the United States who need foster care and only half of those needs are being met, I figured that this was an area that I could be involved in. In fact, 35 years ago, my husband and I took into our home two little foster boys, ages two and three, whose mother was living in a beat up old roach infested car and whose husband had long since left her alone with these children. She simply needed temporary assistance. And so we took her two little boys into our home for a season. Once she got her life in order, and thankfully she did, the boys returned to their mom. And that's one of the goals of foster care, temporary help and then restoring them to their rightful place with their parents if they're fit and able. But isn't that a little bit like God and what he did for us? He saw the need, he recognized our sinful nature, and he gave up his son and provided a place of eternal security for us. Even if we don't have an earthly father, we do have a heavenly father who wraps his arms around us and loves us unconditionally. That's the model of what we should be doing for those in need around us. And that, dear friends, is our note of hope for today. Thanks so much for joining us and God bless you.